Good morning. Welcome to this morning's plenary session. Welcome to the John T. Willis plenary session made possible by annual gifts from Abilene Christian University. Professor Willis, who was with us this morning, recently retired after 61 years of teaching, 46 at Abilene Christian University and 15 at Lipscomb University. Dr. Willis was a popular and demanding preacher, undergraduate teacher, undergraduate students loved him and were so thrilled that he remembered their name even after the first day of class. Graduate students loved him and were scared to death that he remembered their names after the first day <laughs> of class. Professor Willis, of course, is a luminary in the Hebrew Bible. He's a serious scholar, a servant of the church, and demonstrates by the life he lives that life can be integrated. Recent Willis plenaries at the Christian Scholars Conference have highlighted his interdisciplinary appreciations and scholarship. And the conference has a rich history of hearing from the greatest poets of our time, Billy Collins and Dana Joya, and Christian Wyman, Linda Paston, last year, Marie Howe. But this is the first occasion in this conference's 38-year history where we have had the honor to hear from the current U.S. Poet Laureate. Tracy K. Smith. And so in preparation for this hour, I've experienced a delightful year of reading from Smith's collection of poetry to her memoir, Ordinary Light, which is an exquisite story of faith and loss and what it means to be black in America. It's a tender and honest memoir. She says the world of her family was the only heaven she needed to believe in or Upon hearing the death of her grandfather, I recognized a heartbreak so undisguised, it collapsed me in tears. Oh, to articulate what we feel inside. We are a family of scholars, and I hope to introduce Ms. Smith, whose faith was shaped in part by her time at Harvard Chapel listening to the preaching of Peter Gomes. I hope to introduce her today to Bob and Jan Randolph or Miss Smith's mother, who was part of the Montgomery bus boycott. I hope to introduce her today to Fred Gray, who was Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King Jr.'s lawyer, the heart, the moral and legal heart of the movement that electrified the black community and the country and the world and swept up Miss Smith's mother. But to better introduce Tracy K. Smith, the current U.S. Poet Laureate, to all of us, is Susan Blassingame, Dean of Arts and Sciences at Lubbock Christian University. Susan is a Christian Scholars Conference Advisory Board member extraordinaire. She will serve as host to the Christian Scholars Conference when we move to, to Lubbock, Texas next year in 2019. So Susan, tell us about the poet who is interested in the way our voices sound when we dip below the decibel of politics. <clears throat> Hold on. There we go. This is good. Uh, earlier this week in a session on vocation, I was reminded of a very important uh, rule, I suppose, uh, that we should think about as we go through life, and that is that recognition is the first step toward reconciliation. Uh, how do we come to recognize the other and to recognize ourselves is an important question. And uh, as an English professor, I'm often asked, uh, so what's up with poetry? Why do we have to read poetry? Why, why is poetry important? Why is poetry at the Christian Scholars Conference important? Why have we committed to bringing uh, poets and writers, people of letters, to the Christian Scholars Conference. Uh, I just came from a session entitled, Reading Craig Tracy K. Smith's Wade in the Water, Poetry Evangelist Revealed. I came up with that title, Poetry Evangelist, upon reading some of the material that has been published about uh, Professor Smith and the last few months, uh, particularly in the New York Times book review. So I highly recommend that you Google those and, and go find them because 
She comes across as a very real person, and uh, so does her poetry. So let's think about titles for a moment. Professor Smith, Poet Laureate Smith, or as one of our panelists earlier said, uh, Plotus, Poet Laureate of the United States. Uh, poetry Evangelist. Well, poems are a way to know who we are. Uh, and she said uh, in her response to the panelists in the last session, poetry is a way to talk to each other in a way that we can't talk in, in other situations. Uh, and she also said, and I, I wrote this down and rewrote my introduction because of it, uh, poetry is essential to democracy. And she reminded us that poems are a way that we can describe pain, but also they offer hope and a path to resilience. And uh, if poetry only did that, that would be a magnificent thing. Uh, Plotus, Plotus Smith said, when you read a poem, when you really read it, you make yourselves vulnerable to the possibility of compassionate citizenship, something that I think we need and that uh, she addresses in many of the poems in her uh, latest volume, Wade in the Water. Professor Smith has won a Pulitzer Prize uh, among many other awards. And she serves as professor of humanities and the director of the creative writing program at Princeton University. But today, she joins us as a member of the Christian Scholars Conference. So let's give her a warm welcome. And I know you're going to love her poetry. Thank you. Um, what a delight it is to be here. Um, I was relieved at how pleasant it was to listen to people discuss my work uh, this morning. Uh, so I feel like I'm in a safe place and I also feel really excited about the different intersections that this conference uh, represents. As a poet, um, I'm invested in the different vocabularies um, that, that each of us lives in. Um, I think my poetry allows me to tr seek a kind of synthesis between the different uh, versions of the self that I am, you know, as a, someone who is a member of an institution of higher learning, someone who is also a parent, someone who's an American and a woman, someone who's compelled by questions of justice and race, uh, someone who loves the natural world, someone who was once a child, someone you know, the list goes on for, for me as it does for you. Um, I like the idea that poems allow the different um, layers that we accrue uh, because we spend a lot of time in a single place or because we are protecting ourselves against something. All of the layers that kind of en enfold us a poem helps us peel them away and get to something that feels essential. Um, I know we read poems alone, but we read with the idea that we are listening to another person's voice. And I think that does bring us into a kind of community which feels real and it feels useful and instructive. Um, I think I... I'd like to start by reading a, just a small passage from my memoir, partly because I think it describes the dawning sense that the vocabulary that I was seeking to be initiated into as a, an aspiring poet um, had much in common to do with the vocabulary of faith that I grew up with and the vocabulary that my mother, as someone who was deeply faithful, lived um, throughout her life with and uh, cleaved to at the end of her life. So I'll open with just a few pages um, of a brief chapter from Ordinary Light, which is called Another Dialect of the Soul. Be in the world, but not of the world. How many times had those words traveled from her mouth to my ear? 
How many times had she implored me to pray for guidance, to give thanks, to claim the promise that God did not give me a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. All our life together, even before her diagnosis, she had been preparing us. Not just my siblings and me, I now realize, but our father too, to survive her. And not just to survive, but to manifest the courage and the might her belief had always insisted we possess. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. She made me say it over and over again whenever I doubted. She made me say it to myself until it said itself. And once it did that, I didn't need to hear it anymore because I knew. Maybe that is the sum, the end all of belief. Not a zealous adamancy, but a quiet certainty. My mother's language was always the language of the soul, but it grew clearer, more telegraphic, once the cancer began to accelerate her sense that she was on her way elsewhere. So much of the time, living with such knowledge, her mind must have been tuned to the idea of what awaited her. I go to prepare a place for you. If it were not so, I would have told you. In some strange way, the return to the soul state might simply be the answer to the prayer that sits behind every prayer. Deliver me. Is there another dialect of the soul, a way it speaks in those who don't possess the vocabulary of belief? a way it stirs and surges, as if to say, here I am, something we don't hear, but that we feel, and feeling, no. I liked to sit in the leather armchairs facing the tall winds. Maybe I should have prefaced this by saying, this is a book about lots of things, but one of the main things is uh, losing my mother um, to cancer when I was 22 and she was 59. And so this chapter is set uh, during my time as an undergrad at Harvard, where you know her uh, diagnosis was becoming more and more uh, clear to me what it meant, and where poetry was also becoming something that was real in my life. I liked to sit in the leather armchairs facing the tall windows in Lamont Library. The windows looked out onto Mass Ave at the intersection of Quincy Street, and when I'd glance up from my page, I'd see people I knew and people I didn't know moving back and forth along the axes of their lives. The reading room silence would obliterate all the outside traffic noises, and the daylight would baptize the pedestrians, it seemed to me, in a kind of transparent splendor. As if, for the few moments they appeared in frame, they were resplendent in the inviolable promise we were all of us born into. It didn't matter if they were in a rush or a daze if they coughed into their fists, or if smoke streamed from their mouths. Each wore, for an instant if not more, a mantle of eminent belonging, as if the moment that held them was not a mistake, as if they were not lost, or alone, or under a heap of insurmountable dread. Here I am, something in them seemed to be saying to the pavement, the fallen leaves, to no one in particular. I was taking a poetry workshop, my third so far at Harvard. In it, I had discovered that sitting down with an idea and letting it unfold in words and sounds offered me not just pleasure, but an indescribable comfort. I wanted to write the kind of poetry that people read and remembered, that they lived by, the kinds of lines that I carried with me from moment to moment on a given day without even having chosen to. Back out of all this now too much for us, said Robert Frost. And when I heard his words in my ears, they gave weight and purpose to my footsteps, 
to the breath going in and out of my lungs. They gave me terms with which to consider bits and pieces of the things I otherwise didn't know how to acknowledge. Frost's voice telling me to retreat. At least that's part of what I heard in that line, hovering in space on its own, apart from the rest of the poem or even the rest of its sentence, emboldened me to admit that, yes, I was overwhelmed. My mother's cancer overwhelmed me. Her death, waiting out there in the distance, overwhelmed me. So did the loneliness I still sometimes felt, even amid the chatter and bustle of friends and classes. Perhaps, without realizing it, I, like my mother long before she belonged to me, had been seeking something, searching, not for any one thing in particular, and not as a result of a single glaring lack, but seeking, searching nonetheless. Poetry met my particular sense of need. Writing a poem, I sometimes felt like I was building a house from scratch, raising the walls, hanging the doors, laying out the rooms. It felt at times like back-breaking work. Other times, it seemed that what I was trying to evoke or encounter in a poem was already alive somewhere, and that my job was merely to listen The language of each of the poetry workshops I'd taken was built upon the assumption that there really was something else at play. My teachers talked about our poems as if they were sentient beings with plans and wishes of their own, wishes it was up to us to carry into language. Your poem seems to be leading you in one direction, but you insist upon going in another. Or... Try and cut out all this noise so you can hear what the poem is trying to tell you. It sounded quite nearly mystical, like we were playing at divination, but it also rang true. Wasn't it strange that a poem, written in my vocabulary and as a result of my own thoughts or observations, could, when it was finished, manage to show me something I hadn't already known? Sometimes, when I tried very hard to listen to what the poem I was writing was trying to tell me, I felt the way I imagined godly people felt when they were trying to discern God's will. Write this, the poem would sometimes consent to say, and I'd revel in a joy to rival the saints that poetry, this mysterious presence I talked about, and professed belief in might truly be real. So I'm sitting in the window thinking about language, threading my questions, worries, doubts, and fears into sentences made me happy, as did the deep, visceral longing that the voices of other poets awakened in me, a longing for the kind of momentary belonging that came from getting hold of an idea that had been waiting all along just for me when I felt the presence of that other thing, the voice that seemed to be speaking to my hand as it moved across the page, I became clear-headed and steady, richer with something I hadn't known I possessed. Was that what my mother felt when she prayed? Was it what she quieted herself to hear so often during the days and nights, calling it Lord? Perhaps it was and is external, adrift, moving among the living like weather. Perhaps what it teaches us, no matter who we are, is our own necessary language, one that is both wholly new and yet familiar from a time that predates every other thing we recognize, even ourselves. So those are some... Thank you. Those are some, I guess, kind of like the founding principles that I think still determine uh, how I operate as a poet. Um, but I also will say, I learned the word uh, theopoetics by looking through the conference uh, bulletin. And it 
it, it made immediate sense to me because I feel like um, in so many ways what I'm attempting to do is to find the thing that sits on the other side of this experience that we, we are a part of. And poetry is one of the tools with which I'm almost like dowsing um, toward that um, source. Um, I'm going to read a few poems from my last book, or my last two books, Life on Mars and Wait in the Water, um, partly because I think that they uh, embody a kind of um, maybe private theology, or, or they at the very least document a kind of search towards something like that. So I'll tell you about where Life on Mars came from. It's a book that I started writing um, almost in a, in a cavalier way. I, I thought that if I wanted to keep asking the same question that I ask in my poems, which is, what do we do to each other? What's the effect? Why? Can we, can we change what we do? Um, if I wanted to keep asking that, I needed to find a different context within which to kind of work through that or those questions. And so um, science fiction um, presented itself to me. I'd written a poem that got pulled from my second book that was called Sci-Fi. And it was a poem that was imagining um, a future. I, I realized writing it what I bet everybody else already knows, which is that the genre of science fiction, probably like any genre, is a way of exploring our anxieties about the present moment, about who we are right now, by projecting into a distant future. Um, and I had fun doing that, because I have a lot of anxieties about who we are, what we do, what America is. Um, and while I was working on poems that allowed me to dwell in um, you know, a sense of the future as had been articulated by filmmakers in the 60s and 70s when I grew up watching a lot of um, you know, Charlton Heston movies with my, my parents in the living room or, or um, someone as you know, brilliant and, and majestic as, as Stanley Kubrick in, in his film 2001. Um, while I was thinking about the remote future and even you know, maybe the actual space that we belong to, um, and devising a visual vocabulary for that, my father passed away. And suddenly I found my questions changed. Um, I wanted to know where he was. I wanted to devise a sense of the afterlife that I would be comfortable um, surrendering him to. I wanted to do a gut renovation on the Old Testament God that I grew up seeing, you know, with the white beard, um, with all the human characteristics of jealousy and anger, um, the God that tested people. I wanted to make that figure into something as large, as um, perfect, and systematic as what we believe we know about the universe as even like a system like math, which is so immense and, and perfect. And so I was allowing myself, myself to think about space as the place where God exists and to allow my own personal needs as driven by grief to determine the parameters of that, that figure. So I'm going to read you some of the poems in the book that helped me to do that, um, even if that's not what I thought they were doing. The weather in space. Is God being or pure force? The wind or what commands it? When our lives slow and we can hold all that we love, it sprawls in our laps like a gangly doll. When the storm kicks up and nothing is ours, we go chasing after all we're certain to lose. So alive, faces radiant with panic. I'll read you two poems that are, I think, in, in conversation with each other um, and that are... are really deliberately thinking about what God is, what we want God or need God to be. This one is called Cathedral Kitsch. Um, 
I think it's kind of flippant, in, at least in it, its opening lines. I like it when a poem, the poem that I'm writing, kind of pulls me into a different lane and says, this is what you think you're writing about, but I think this is what we're going we're gonna to write about together. So this happens. Um, I, I actually was listening to a teacher kind of dis discuss some of my poems with his students not too long ago, and he asked them, where do you think the beginning of this poem ends? and the middle of the poem begins. And I was thinking, oh, that's a great way of locating that moment where the poem swerves onto its actual material. It's like unconscious material. Cathedral Kitsch. Does God love gold? Does he shine back at himself from walls like these, leafed in the earth's softest wealth? Women light candles, pray into their fistful of beads. Cameras spit human light into the vast holy dark, and what glistens back is high up and cold. I feel man here, the same wish that named the planets. Man with his shoes and tools his insistence to prove we exist just like God in the large and the small, the great and the frayed, in the cords that rise from the tall brass pipes and the chorus of crushed cans someone drags over cobbles in the secular street. Um, a lot of the poems in this book, the ones that are thinking more um, actively about the universe, trying to um, grasp that vocabulary of physics for the little brief windows of time when it's possible for someone like me to do that, um, a lot of them have this large kind of hovering it, you know, like maybe it's like this or what if it is like that. Um, and so this is a poem that kind of gathers those many its around itself, it and company. We are a part of it, not guests. Is it us or what contains us? How can it be anything but an idea, something teetering on the spine of the number I? It is elegant, but coy. It avoids the blunt ends of our fingers as we point. We have gone looking for it everywhere, in Bibles and bandwidth, blooming like a wound from the ocean floor. Still, it resists the matter of false versus real, Unconvinced by our zeal, it is unappeasable. It is like some novels, vast and unreadable. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I'm just turning, I'm not waiting for that. I'm just turning pages. Um, maybe I'll read you a, um, a couple of elegies uh, for my father and then, and then read some of the, the poems from the newer um, collection. Um, I think that um, a big part of what I imagine, you know, that we as artists or poets are doing is listening. Uh, so on one level, maybe I'm listening for something that's outside of myself. Um, I'm also listening for the quiet and easy to miss voice of the unconscious mind, which knows more than I do, uh, which sometimes, you know, will, will enter into the process if I can distract myself, um, maybe with a, a form to contemplate or a metaphor to sink into, um, and then this other kind of, of knowledge or insight comes in. Um, of course, we're listening to um, the voices of other writers. We're listening to kind of like voices that characterize the time that, that we live in. I'm also, um, I think, listening to history and trying to hear something in voices from another time period that might be useful or, or instructive to now. 
Um, we'll get to that, but I'm going to read you a cut. This is a poem that is kind of thinking, thinking about what if my father or my mother, who's also gone, um, are here somehow. Um, this is from a sequence called The Speed of Belief. Probably he spun out of himself and landed squarely in that there, his new body capable lean, vibrating at the speed of belief. She was probably waiting in the light everyone describes, gesturing for him to come. Surely, they spent the whole first day together, walking past the city and out into the orchards where perfect figs and plums ripen without fear. They told us not to go tipping tables looking for them, not even to visit their bodies in the ground. They are sometimes maybe what calls out to people stuck in some impossible hell. The ones who later recall, I heard a voice saying, go. And finally, as if by magic, I was able simply to go. You stepped out of the body, unzipped it like a coat, and will it drag you back as flesh, voice, scent? What heat burns without touch, and what does it become? What are they that move through these rooms without even the encumbrance of shadows. If you are one of them, I praise the God of all gods, who is nothing and nowhere, a law, immutable proof. And if you are bound by habit or will to be one of us again, I pray you are what waits to break back into the world through me. It's not that death was thinking of you or me or our family or the woman our father would abandon when he died. Death was thinking what it owed him, his ride beyond the body, its garments, beyond the taxes that swarm each year, the car and its fuel injection, the fruit trees heavy in his garden. Death led him past the aisles of tools, the freezer lined with meat, the television saying over and over, seek and ye shall find. So why do we insist he has vanished? that death ran off with our everything worth having. Why not that he was swimming only through this life, his slow, graceful crawl, shoulders rippling, legs slicing away at the waves, gliding further into what life itself denies. He's only gone so far as we can tell, though when I try, I see the white cloud of his hair in the distance like an eternity. Thank you. While I was grieving my father, I was also expecting my first child. And um, I, it was, you know, a complicated time, right? I had this sense of someone gone, someone waiting to come the fantasy that maybe they were together somehow. But I also was thinking about the world. Um, I was reading the news, listening to the news all the time, and feeling worried about the fact of having chosen to bring another person into the world where every day terrible things happen. And um, I started writing a poem during the spring of 2009 that was just kind of almost cataloging all of these hate crimes that happened in about a six-week period. It seemed like I would 
open the newspaper every day and there was another story to add to this poem. And um, the poem began from a place of anger, vexation at the um, small-minded adamancy, the, um, you know, like, hate, I guess that's the word for it, that, that causes people to make these awful choices toward each other. And um, the poem wasn't going to survive if it was just an angry rant. And I got to a moment where I said, when I think, whenever I think about my father, I tell myself that now that he's out of this life, he understands. He maybe sees what I'm doing. He understands what my life is like, what it's about, and he's not worried, and he's not judging me. Um, he's just compassionate. He, he gets it. And I said, what if, what if that's a, a given? What if that is something that everyone who dies uh, finds themselves feeling? Um, and suddenly the victims of these hate crimes offered me the ability to kind of think in, in compassionate or quiet terms about you know, these, these events. Um, so this is a poem, I'm gonna read you one section of what is a long poem called, They May Love All That He Has Chosen and Hate All That He Has Rejected. And in this poem there, I, I'll just gloss the, the victims um, and their, their assailants. Um, Stephen P. Morgan on May 6, 2009, uh, shot and killed Wesleyan undergraduate Johanna Justin Jinich. Um, he had a journal that had a lot of um, anti-Semitic entries and entries that were specifically talking about the desire to kill this young woman. On May 28th, an off-duty New York police officer, Omar Edwards, was fatally shot by fellow officer Andrew P. Dunton. Edwards, who was black, drew his weapon after encountering and racing after a man who was breaking into his car in Harlem, New York. An officer Dunton, one of three white officers in an unmarked police car, um, saw this and um, approached him and shot him. Uh, May 30th, members of a group called the Minutemen American Defense Group arrived at the home of Raul Flores wearing law enforcement uniforms, and when he opened the door, they opened fire and killed him, and they were a group that uh, was upset about immigration. Um, his, his young daughter, Brisenia, was killed as well. Uh, May 31st, a late-term abortion practitioner, Dr. George Tiller, was shot and killed in the foyer of his church in Kansas, and Scott Roeder was taken into custody for that shooting. And then this is the event that I think most people will remember. On June 10th of that year, an 88-year-old white supremacist named James Von Braun entered the Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington and killed um, a 39-year-old security guard named Stephen Tyrone Johns before being shot in the face by museum security. So those are the, the lives and the deaths that this poem is contemplating. But I got to a moment in the, po the writing of the poem where this strange idea occurred to me. Um, this is section four in which the dead send postcards to their assailants from America's most celebrated landmarks. Dear Shauna, how are you? Today we took a boat out to an island. It was cold, even though the sun was hot on my skin. When we got off the boat, there was a statue of a big tall lady. My daddy and I rode in an elevator all the way up to the top of her head. My daddy says we're free now to do whatever we want. I told him I wanted to jump through the window and fly home to Arizona. I hope to become a dancer or a veterinarian. Love, Brisenia. Dear James, I walked the whole mall today from the Capitol to the Lincoln Memorial. I thought I'd skip the museum altogether, but my feet wanted to go there, so I let them. I stood outside the doors trying to see in, but it was so bright, my own reflection was all that shone back at me. I can choose to feel or not to feel. I realized that today. 
Mostly, it's just nice to move through the crowds like I used to, unnoticed. Only now, they move through me, too. Men, women, everyone feeling untouched. But I've touched them. It's funny. I feel like myself. The breeze off the Potomac is calm. Sincerely, Stephen. Hello, Scott. I thought of you today from a small gray pod inside the St. Louis Arch. We inched up, notch by notch, like some Cold War rendition of the womb. At the top, the doors yawned open, and we pushed through the people waiting to go back down. The views, mostly of a stadium. On the other side, you see the old city in passive decline. You realize how small you are up there, but everyone still acts normal size. We were an assault on the sleek arch, silent and gleaming alongside the ageless Mississippi. But the guys on the ground keep selling tickets and sending more up. You can feel wind rocking the structure all the way at the top. See you around, George. S. I'm happy. I'll probably be in Greece soon, or the mountains of Chile. I used to think my body was a container for love. There is so much more now without my body, a kind of ecstasy. Tonight, I'm at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. I don't know where I end. The night is starry, and the stars are blue and shiver in the distance, Jay. Dear Andrew, I'm still here. I don't think of you often, but when I do, I think you must look at people slowly, spinning through the versions of their lives before you speak. I think you must wonder what's under their coats, in their fists, what words sit warming in their throats. I think you feel humble, human. I hardly think of you, but when I do, it's usually that. Yours, Omar, Harlem, USA. I'll read three poems from Wait in the Water, which is a book that is really seeking to kind of um, metabolize the lesson of, of compassion. It's looking toward history for, you know, moments when that was not the case. It's trying actively to look at quiet moments in, you know, my everyday life where compassion isn't the automatic uh, impulse. Um, and it's also thinking about America and um, what feels like a dark moment of um, fear and um, distrust and, um, you know, will, willful um, wrongheadedness um, on all sides. So I'm going to start with the title poem, which is like the breath of hope, which comes out of an experience of attending a ring shout in coastal Georgia, which, as you know, is a tradition that celebrates the um, spiritual and the history that it, it is connected to, which is, you know, um, the history of survival and um, resilience uh, during the period when people were enslaved in this country, and also the um, history of escape. Um, each song that comes from this tradition has a surface message, which is about loving God, about knowing God is there for you, knowing that God will, will redeem you. And then under the surface, there's often a message that says, if you want to escape to freedom, remember these things. So wade in the water is a great example because it's saying, you know, as in the Old Testament, God delivered the Israelites. Uh, God will trouble the water so that you will get to where you need to get to. Um, 
under the surface, as the title says, if you don't want to be tracked by dogs, wade in the water. So that scent is going to get uh, lost. Wade in the water. One of the women greeted me. I love you, she said. She didn't know me, but I believed her. And a terrible new ache rolled over in my chest, like in a room where the drapes have been swept back. I love you. I love you. As she continued down the hall, past other strangers, each feeling pierced suddenly by pillars of heavy light. I love you throughout the performance, in every hand clap, every stomp. I love you in the rusted iron chains someone was made to drag until love let them be unclasped and left empty in the center of the ring. I love you in the water where they pretended to wade, singing that old blood-deep song that dragged us to those banks and cast us in. I love you, the angles of it scraping at each throat, shouldering past the swirling dust motes in those beams of light that whatever we now knew we could let ourselves feel knew to climb. Oh, woods. Oh, dogs. Oh, tree. Oh, gun. Oh, girl, run. Oh, miraculous, many, gone. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Is this love the trouble you promised? Um, so this is a, um, a lot of the center of the book is thinking about history. Uh, it's thinking about the experience of blacks during the Civil War. It's seeking to reconstruct, oddly enough, through correspondence between slaveholders, what the perspective or experience might have been of people who were enslaved on their plantations. Um, and so race is a big theme in the book, and I think it's an unanswered or unresolved question. Um, conundrum in our culture. I'm going to read you a poem that's called The United States Welcomes You, but it appears just after all of this stuff that has to do with this particular history, and I hope that's something that creates a sense of connection. The United States Welcomes You. Why and by whose power were you sent? What do you see that you may wish to steal. Why this dancing? Why do your dark bodies drink up all the light? What are you demanding that we feel? Have you stolen something? Then what is that leaping in your chest? What is the nature of your mission? Do you seek to offer a confession have you anything to do with others brought by us to harm? Then why are you afraid? And why do you invade our night? Hands raised, eyes wide, mute as ghosts. Is there something you wish to confess? Is this some enigmatic type of test? What if we fail? How and to whom do we address our appeal? And I'll close, thank you. Um, um, I'll close with a, a poem that is um, rooted in, you know, just kind of my quotidian experience, and that's also saying, okay, a, a, writing a poem allows you to get to the, the high-minded place, um, but life is about also being kind of like in the low and uh, kind of like regrettable space, like 
This is one of those poems. It's called Charity. She is like a squat old machine, off kilter but still chugging along the uphill stretch of sidewalk on Harrison Street, handbag slung crosswise and, I'm guessing, heavy. And oh, the set of her face, her brows profound tracks, her mouth cinched, lips pressed flat, watching her bend forward to tussle with gravity, watching the birth she allows each foot as if one is not on civil terms with the other, watching her shoulders braced as if lashed by step after step after step, and her eyes' determination not to shift or blink or rise, I think, I am you, one day out of five, tired, empty, hating what I carry, but afraid to lay it down, stingy, angry, doing violence to others, by the sheer freight of my gloom, halfway home, wanting to stop, to quit, but keeping going mostly out of spite. Thank you. So, um, thank you. We do have time for a few questions, and I see there are microphones if anybody has a question. Questions of the U.S. Poet Laureate. Okay. Hi, Tracy. Hi. Um, You're a professor of humanities as well as a uh, poet. Um, You teach. Uh, Who were the poets that you introduced your students to? And uh, uh, what are some of the things in their work that that animate your own uh, sense of of vocation? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I teach a lot of contemporary voices, but not exclusively. Uh, One of the the voices I really love to start with early in the semester is Elizabeth Bishop. Um, And we spend time looking over her four books of poems. I know she's a poet who's often taught because of her masterful descriptive skills. I think that's instructive and useful for students, but I like urging my students to recognize that the world that the speakers of Bishop's poems are so eagerly trying to recreate isn't the um, motivation for the poem. They're often looking for something that sits underneath or behind the surface, something that might uh, cause a sense of upheaval or um, something that might even claim or change the speaker. So I love to think about how the work that we do in a technical way Um, to create or recreate a sense of place or encounter is actually in service of something else that it's harder to name, you know, something that that might have to do with um, recalibrating our sense of experience, um, allowing us to touch base with something that in real time eludes us. Um, And so I think she's such a great... There are a lot of wonderful moves that she makes in her poems that I think my students also and I... um, can learn from. Um, I love the work of Lucille Clifton, who was one of my teachers. Uh, You probably maybe hear some of my, like, yearning toward her cosmic perspective in some of my poems. Um, But she's a poet who was really committed to writing about black life in a variety of ways, Um, committed to thinking about um, the planet in different terms, and was also courageous enough to think about the mystery that we are a part of. And I love, I love looking at how those kinds of unanswerable questions can get anchored in a poem in different ways. Sometimes I give my students the assignment 
if we read um, something like Clifton's sequence, which is uh, the message from the ones uh, received in the late 1970s, it's a, a brief sequence of poems that she wrote after her husband died, um, really believing that she was being spoken to by something else. Um, it's hard to really kind of like explain that, but I love the fact that she just, that's the given of the poem. These are messages received. They're urgent messages for humankind and they have to do with loving each other. They have to do with um, humility towards the environment. They have to do with um, changing our imaginary framework for God and the heavenly. Um, so I ask my students, now, I can't urge you to have a, a numinous experience, but imagine that you are, you're, you're writing a poem from a perspective that is not human, and you're speaking to the human that you are. What would you say? I think it's a really wonderful um, exercise in shifting authority and a asking the imagination to go to a place that it fundamentally shouldn't be equipped to go. Um, so those are some of the things that I do. Thanks for asking that question. What influence has the Renaissance and 17th century poets had on your poetry? Um, I used to have a mentor that um, would always, every time I asked him a big question, he would say, well, as um, Mao Zedong said when they asked what the effect of the French Revolution was, it's too soon to tell. <laughs> and I feel like that, <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go with that answer. Uh, it's too soon to tell. Um, I like the idea that there's a sense of, um, there's a sense of um, possibility and hope and divinity that everyday language might be able to touch. Um, I like the idea that science or scientific methodology is something that can speak to the arts and that can animate a poem, even if it's not on the surface. Um, I know that I've em embraced or, or just kind of drawn from Renaissance art and literature in different ways over the course of my life as a reader, but I, I don't know <laughs> beyond that. Tracy, we have time for one more question, and here it is. You've talked about what you've done in the past. What are you working on now? Um, I'm working on some different types of projects for me. Uh, I'm co-translating with a Chinese speaker, a contemporary Chinese poet named Yi Lei, who is a poet whose most famous work comes from the 80s and 90s. She's a feminist poet. She also, I think, her later poems are thinking about authority, um, law, freedom, and the planet. And um, so I'm, I'm working on that. Those poems will get published in about two years as a, as a sort of selected. And I'm working on a libretto for an opera with the composer Gregory Spears, which is called Castor and Patience, that is rooted in um, the history of that, that ring shout, actually, that, that um, s geography in this country where Blacks who were uh, emancipated were able to buy land from the government during Reconstruction and pass that land down to their you know, children and grandchildren. Some of it's still in the same families, but it's on places like Hilton Head or um, St. Helena that are really sought after by real estate developers. And so there's a tension between what the future of these kinds of places will be. So our opera is exploring those kinds of questions and that'll premiere in 2020 in Cincinnati. Thanks. Okay, thank you. So you might ask, what does being PLOTUS mean? Um, you get a budget and you get to spend that as you will in furthering the cause of poetry. And uh, Professor Smith has been spending her time uh, going to small communities throughout uh, the United States to read poetry and talk about poetry in, a, in an attempt to uh, encourage conversation 
amongst people and to heal this sort of divisiveness that she feels uh, in our uh, country today. And she reminded us that a lot of times it is the older poets that we go back to or different poets and we remember lines of work uh, that we uh, heard there. And I'm reminded of a, the ending of a poem by Marge Piercy, To Be of Use, uh, which ends this way. A pitcher cries for water to carry and a person for work that is real. And I think Tracy Smith is doing real work. Uh, so uh, there are books, and she will sign them out in the foyer. And I have a whole series of announcements here from uh, David Fleer. Um, lunch for most of the participants is in the Shamblin Theater, which is in the Student Union Building across the square. Follow the crowd, um, and some of you have purchased tickets for the Foster Lunch, and that is in the Paul Rogers Boardroom in Ezell. Uh, I'll remind you also that Smith will be one of the guests, along with Tobias Wolf and uh, Tokens tonight, and we hope to see you there. So have a good day.